Good afternoon, and welcome to Ministry on the Web, coming from Christ Baptist Church in Burlington, New Jersey. Today, on this Good Friday, a fellowship of churches have come together to share the last seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. All of us rejoice to know that Jesus would not come down from the cross, just that he might live, but he indeed chose to die in order that we might have life, and that abundantly. As we think about it in the last hours of his life, his heart and mind were on you and I and our relationship with his father. A heartfelt appreciation for service collaboration goes out to pastors Theodore King, John Grove, Terrence Morrison, Kevin Lowe, Winfred Sanders, and Reverend Guy Bowen for ministering in the word. Let's prepare ourselves to share in worship and receive the word in joyous fellowship, remembering the suffering of our Savior. Shall find 
Good afternoon. I greet you in the name of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To the pastor here at Christ Baptist Church, the Reverend Bogan, and to all of you, I greet you in the name of the Lord on this Good Friday. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time and this opportunity. Father God, to stand here before your people, Father God, and preach your word, Father God, from one of the sayings of Jesus on the cross. God, I ask that you use me, Father God, to your glory, Father God. Let your power that you have given me to preach with, Father God, and your Holy Spirit, Father God, move throughout this, uh, this time, Father God, and also, Father God, move throughout the waves of my voice, Father God, goes into the screens, Father God, and get out to the people's ears. God, I pray, Father God, that somebody will be healed, delivered, and set free, Father God, from the message that are preached on today. God, use us, Father God. This we ask in Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the first word of uh, Jesus on the cross, sayings of Jesus on the cross. It will be found in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. If I for a moment can talk to you for, from a subject or a thought, he prayed for them. He prayed for them. If I can also tell you that on today that as we look at this text, we cannot begin this text here where Jesus is on the cross asking the Father for forgiveness for the people. But we have to really start from why Jesus is on the cross. When God created man and he created him in his image, he created two, two people. He created him Adam and Eve. And on that day that he created Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve were given certain instructions. Adam was given instructions not to eat of the fruit of the garden. There was two trees. He said, do not eat from these trees. And when Adam was told this, he said, because if you do eat this thing, he said, you will surely die. So Adam began to go about doing the work that God called him to do. But one day that God put Adam to sleep and pulled out of him, out of his rib, there came out of a woman. He called her Eve. And then when Eve was walking through the garden on one day, the Bible says this, that the Eve began to desire the fruit that was on the tree that was forbidding to eat. As she was being beguiled by the uh, serpent, the serpent began to tempt her, and she began to eat the fruit because out of her curiosity and she passed it on to her, 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 her husband and then when she passed it on to him he began to eat of that fruit and then humanity died. Humanity died not physically but spiritually because humanity has now lost its connection to God and so God had he had to do something about the mistake that Adam had made. Now when the Bible tells us that when it happened the heaven shut up and God was calling out. He said, Adam, Adam, where art thou? And Adam uh, heard the voice of the Lord in the wilderness and began to start doing something. He began to run, him and Eve began to run and hide and made leaves of clothing for their bodies. And he said, Adam, where art thou? It was not that God did not know his geographical location, but he said, Adam, you're no longer with me no more. So that brings on the dilemma now because God has created man in his image, in his likeness, and he created man to be, have dominion on earth just like God has dominion on heaven and in, on earth. But now Adam has put humanity in a predicament that humanity has to pay a price for something that they can't pay. Let me take it back. Uh, Anselm wrote in, uh, in one of his treaties, he said, he wrote a treatise and it said, Cor de homo. In Latin, that means that, uh, that why God human, or in English, why God became a man. And he said why God had to become a man because there was a price that needed to pay, but man could not pay the debt that man owed to God because of the justice that needed to be done for sin. 
So God did something which was called incarnation, which is a concept that we call kenosis, is which God has emptied out himself and put on flesh. And that means now that when God had to put on flesh, that God had to take two natures. One nature was called human that owed the debt, but at the same time had another nature which was called divine. It had to be put in the same body. And that right there was called, when God, when God had to put those two natures together, and when he had put those two natures together, he had to put them in the same body, but human cannot touch the divine, and divine cannot be human because it would not be all human, and it would not be all divine if they co-mingled in the same body or touching. So God had put these two natures together and said, I'm going to call him Jesus, put him on the cross. And when he's on the cross, Jesus now is beginning to pray. Jesus made a prayer, and the prayer that Jesus made at this moment was, Father, forgive them. At the time that man is on the, Jesus is on the cross, he's crying out for man and asking for forgiveness. Now, check this out. Check, check out the text. The text says that Jesus yelled out, Father, forgive them. This is the same man that when he was in the house one day and the people came and crowded the house that he was in, the people came and crowded the house he was in. Four men brought their friend on a stretcher with them, and he brought him into, they tried to bring him in through the door, but they couldn't bring him through the door. They tried to bring him through the window, couldn't bring him through the window because the the crowd was so heavy, but because the crowd was so heavy that they took the man that was on the bed of afflictions up, up on the top of the, uh, on top of the house and began to start ripping the roof off of the house. When he began to start ripping the roof off the house, uh, the Bible says that Jesus looked up and saw the men's faith and draw the man down. And this is where Jesus said, he said, your sins are forgiven. I can have, I, I, when I looked at the text, I said, wow, what great faith is this, that God, for Jesus forgave this man's sins, but now Jesus, who has been done wrong, has been put to judgment hall. The judgment hall was no fault found in him, but chumped up charges were put on him. Them. He was took into a whipping post. They were beaten until skin and blood and, and all this stuff was coming out of his body. But Jesus still kept on pressing on. Let's get the text. The text says that when Jesus was put on the old rugged cross, uh, his back was opened all up. But his, the, the cross that he was on had, had thorns and bristles and stuff coming out of it. Uh, and that open wound that he had on his back was pressed up against that old wood and that old nasty infested wood. And as Jesus is sitting here lifting himself up with nails in his feet and nails in his hands and trying to breathe out his diaphragm so he can say, Father, forgive them. See, Jesus could have said, I forgive you, but he didn't say that. He said, Father, forgive you. Father, forgive them. Let me tell you about the word forgiveness. The word forgiveness in the Greek means to let them loose. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that Jesus prayed for me while he was on the cross. He could have said anything else, but he said, Father, forgive them. I like that thing right there because he said, Father, let them loose. Let them loose from the penalty that you had them up under. And I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that when Jesus was on the cross and he didn't think about himself, but he was thinking about you and I, because when he said them, it wasn't just the them that was there gambling and ripping his clothes, uh, but he was talking about the them from the past of Adam and to the presence of the people who did him wrong, and then also for the future, which will be us and the mother people right after us. Uh, I don't know about you, but this is the time that we need to reflect about what Jesus said. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they they do. When I was a child, my grandmother used to always tell me something. She said, baby, I know little Jimmy got some issues. I know Jimmy will act out of character, but Jimmy got a condition, and that's the reason why he says the things that he says and do the things. Just forgive him and keep it going. He said, pretty much, he said, just let him off the hook. Uh, he, his, his condition that he's dealing with got him acting the way that he acts. Uh, I don't know about you, but everybody got a little condition. It's called a sin condition, and that's the reason why Jesus was on the cross was dying because he was dying that said I'm going to take care of this so God let them loose from that sin issue because I'm about to destroy it and take care of it. Put the penalty on me. So this day, as we begin to look at this text now, look at it. Now, every time that somebody do something wrong to you, you your obligation as a child of God to sit there and say, I'm going to let you loose. I'm going to let you off the hook because Christ died for me that I can be able to forgive. And he forgave me for everything I've done because I have done some people wrong. I have told some lies. I have stole some money. But I thank God that God was able to give me a time to repent and say, God, forgive me for what I have done. 
So today, before I close my message, I just wanted to let you know that before I hasten to my seat, there is a time that we need to learn how to do what Jesus did on the cross. Uh, learn how to forgive the Negroes and the people who have done us wrong. Uh, I don't care if Grandma did you wrong. I don't care if Pop Pop did you wrong. I don't care if Annie, Sandy May and Annie and Annie and them did you wrong. But guess what? It's time for us to start forgiving one another because the Bible says, even in the prayer, he said, he said, if, unless you want your sins forgiven, you got to know also to forgive and forgiveness not just for you releasing something off of somebody else but it's also to release some stuff off of you but I don't know about you but it's the day that we need to learn how to start forgiving because the time is winding up and as time is too short to live with guilt on our life it's time to be loosed from my situation as I sit here today and as I'm about to take my seat I want you to know today is your day to start saying father forgive them and also forgive me be blessed Amen. Father, I thank you for this time, Father God, that we were able to come together, Father God, and think about forgiveness. Father God, I pray right now, Father God, that somebody on this day, Father God, will say, teach, teach me how to forgive, Father God, even in my pain, even in my sorrow, even in my hurt, Father God. Learn how to forgive that I can also be forgiven. In Jesus' name, amen. the gospel according to Luke, the 23rd chapter, and the beginning at the 39th verse, it reads, and one of the malefactors which hanged railed on him, saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. The second word, the second saying from the cross, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Luke records this second saying from the cross and from Luke's perspective and for our edification, we see at Calvary three crosses containing or holding three men. One is dying in sin. One is dying from sin, and the other in the middle is dying for sin. Jesus, our blessed Lord and Savior, is hanging on a cross, bearing your sins and my sins, but not only that, he bears the sins of the whole world. During this period of time in which Christ is dying for us, we find that there are two thieves hanging on his left side, one on his left and one on his right. And we find that um, this, as Luke records, we find this scene, a scene of continued mockery of the Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, this is the third of three instances where Jesus is mocked. The first mockery came from the Sanhedrin. The second mockery came from the soldiers. 
And the third mockery comes from a sinful criminal who is unrepentant. It's interesting how some people use their dying moments, um, not for the good, but for their own detriment. It is also interesting from our perspective how God can work in the hearts of men to save people from whatever state they're in. Here we see one thief railing on Jesus. And he's saying and even challenging and denigrating the Lord Jesus Christ in his last moments alive. He's saying, if you be the Christ, save yourself. And while you're saving yourself, why don't you save us if you're really the Christ? It is interesting how he's dying for his own crimes and he's dying in his own sins. But on the other side of the Savior, there is another thief that is also dying from sin. We don't know at what point he has come to recognize who Jesus really is, but he makes a uh, interesting point. He rebukes the, the first thief who rails or ridicules the Lord Jesus Christ, and he says, in essence, we deserve what we're getting, but this man speaking of Jesus, has done nothing wrong. And then not only does he rebuke the unrepentant thief, he makes a request to the Lord Jesus Christ. He says of the Lord, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. That's an interesting request, but it's also an indication of the thief's repentant heart, for he recognizes the Lord Jesus Christ as one who will somehow, some way, come through this death of crucifixion and still come out on the other side and establish a kingdom of which he wants to be a part of. He asked the Lord Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. What a change of heart as he has reflected over his life. He has reflected over his crimes and he has somehow, some way seen the true light of God in Jesus Christ. And he says to the Lord Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. In response to his request, the Lord Jesus Christ says something very, very interesting. He says to this dying, repented, sinner, criminal thief, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. It is interesting to note that Luke records this from a perspective of instant salvation. This is, a, this is a, an example of a deathbed confession. A person accepting Christ as their Savior doesn't have time to be baptized, doesn't have time to join a church, doesn't have, have time to be in, uh, uh, indoctrinated into a new members class. But he says in his dying moments, when you come into your kingdom, Lord, remember me. He wants to be remembered by the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to be a part of what Jesus is up to. It's interesting that... Um, there are many people who will turn away from any kind of invitation to be associated with the Lord. They would deny 
his deity. They would deny his person. They would even deny his existence. But here it is. We have a repentant sinner. What a powerful example of what God will do and what the Lord Jesus will do in the life of an individual who has repented of their sins, recognizes Jesus Christ as Savior, and will ask the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul records, I'm reminded of Paul's words where in Romans he said, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you too shall be saved. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus says that today you will be with me in paradise. That tells me that the moment we trust Christ as our Savior, the moment we receive him into our hearts, that you and I are no longer under the penalty of sin, we're no longer under the power of sin, and when we are saved by, marvelously by the Lord Jesus Christ, that immediately we are in God's hands. We are safe in his hands. We are safe and secure in the salvation that the Lord Jesus Christ provides. And my brothers and sisters, I'm reminded of the fact that this repentant sinner sets an example for whosoever will. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, there it is again, whosoever shall believe in him shall have eternal life. Jesus says to this repentant thief, today you will be with me in paradise. My brothers and sisters, it's an encouragement for you and I who already know the Lord Jesus Christ, to take the message of the Savior to those who are dying, those who are lost, and it does not matter what condition they may be in, that if you and I will present the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Lord might work in the hearts of some dying men and women, if they call on the name of the Lord, they too shall be saved. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We praise your name. We thank you for this example at Calvary of the Lord Jesus Christ and these two thieves that were dying on either side of him. We thank you, Lord God, that your grace is sufficient and that the salvation that you provide, Lord Jesus, is powerful enough that when we're at our lowest point, that we can call on you. And Lord God, through faith and by grace, we can receive you as Lord and Savior of our lives and we too shall be saved. Thank you, Lord, that like you told this dying thief, this dying repentant thief that was hanging and dying on that cross, that today you shall be with me in paradise. Thank you, Lord, that the moment we trust you as our Savior, that we're safe, we're secure, we're saved for all eternity. And we thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Hello, friends. I'm Pastor John Grove of Columbus Baptist Church, and I'm glad to be with you through this video on Good Friday. Through the centuries, as the church has remembered Good Friday, we have honed in on what we call the seven last words of Jesus. Jesus prayed to his Father for forgiveness of those who were persecuting him. Jesus also spoke to the thief who repented and asked for the mercy of Jesus. And he said other things. But in the midst of his suffering on the cross, we find a very interesting, very brief, basically two-sentence conversation or speech that Jesus made. And that was what he said to Mary, his mother, and to his disciple John. This is one of the seven last words. I'd like to focus on what he said to them. I turn right now to the Gospel of John, chapter 19, starting at verse 26. It says, When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, his disciple took her into his own home. I'd like to entitle this talk, Making New Families. And I'd like to say three basic things about this. Number one, that Jesus' earthly relationships were ending because he was dying. Number two, I've always wondered, why did he call her woman instead of mother? And third, why is his disciple John not actually named, but rather is called the disciple whom Jesus loved? Let's take a look at those three things. First, his earthly relationships were ending. Jesus was dying. And what we see in this snapshot in the midst of the suffering and the blood, of the, of the cursing and the, the shouting, the laughing, the mocking, while there were soldiers and Jewish leaders and curious crowds watching and, and some very few courageous family members, including Mary and some of the women that came with her, and the disciple John who managed to get close to the cross. What, what a difficult scene this was. So Jesus is looking down and in the midst of all of this, he sees his mother and he sees her standing next to his disciple John. When I stop to think about it, I realize he's right now looking at two of the people in the world that he loves the most. If, if they did not have that close bond, they would not have been together at that moment. Of course, he loved his mother, and the Bible says that John was the one that he called the disciple that I love. So it could be argued that these are the two people that he loved the most. He was speaking to them because, and it's, a, it's just a very human reality, he was dying. His life on earth was about to end, and he was saying goodbye to this earthly life to these two people. Now, of course, we know, and he knew, that in three days he would rise from the dead, and, and then he would spend another 40 days with his friends and family who believed in him, but then he would ascend into heaven. So, yes, indeed, this earthly relationship was ending. His mother, Mary, at this point, was probably a widow. And Jesus, being as an oldest son, had the responsibility in that ancient part of the world and at that time, he had the responsibility for her protection and her provision. As he was dying, he was speaking as an oldest son, and he was expressing his will. This had a binding power to it. He said, that this disciple over here will now become 
your oldest son. He will fulfill his responsibilities that I can no longer fulfill here on earth. He will protect you and he will feed you. I am adopting you to him and him to you. Behold, he said, your son. Now, people who read the Bible will remember that Mary and Joseph had other children. So why didn't Jesus declare that now Mary would come under the charge of the second son? Well, the short answer to this is the Bible tells us that Jesus' brothers did not believe in him yet. They would, after his resurrection, they would, because the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 1 that the brothers and the mother were gathered with the disciples in the upper room after Jesus rose from the dead and after he ascended into heaven. So they would become believers, but they were not believers yet. And, you know, in some ways, if we were Jesus, we might have thought, well, wouldn't uh, there be more financial support and so forth if, if I just... Um, handed her over to uh, my family. But no, to Jesus, the most important thing is what would be the spiritual temperature of that family? And he knew that if she was taken into the family of John, there she would have that healthy spiritual relationship. I just find it really interesting, as I consider Jesus the man, that in, in this act of saving the world by dying on the cross, Jesus was not forgetting his own family. He was not forgetting one individual. He was fulfilling his loving obligation and responsibility to her as well as saving the world. Remember, in those days they had no social security, no Medicare, no pensions, Someone in Mary's situation had to be adopted into some family, and this is what Jesus was taking care of. Well, not only was his relationship with Mary changing, but his relationship to John and to the other disciples. No longer would they be walking up and down the hills of Galilee and Judea. That segment of their relationship was now over. He was moving on now to heaven. And so, his earthly relationships were ending, including those relationships with people that he loved the most. But the second thing I'd like to touch on with you right now is this. Why did Jesus address her in verse 26, as we read, as woman? In the NIV that I read from, I think it kind of softens the impact uh, to the English-speaking reader by saying, dear woman, but literally in the original language, it says, woman, woman, behold your son. Now, that's an, that's an awkward address for our ears to hear. Uh, I mean, if I, if, I walk, if I went into my house with my uh, Irish wife and I addressed her as woman, uh, I wouldn't live very long. Um, if I spoke with ladies in the church or, or f- uh, female friends of mine and, and I addressed her as them as woman, well, they would be highly offended because in our culture, in our time, that's, that's a, a sexist put down. But that's not what Jesus was doing here. Jesus was not addressing his mother as some kind of inferior being because she's a woman and he's a man. That's not what he was doing. But rather, he was now addressing her from the platform and the position of the new relationship that they were coming into. You see, as he's leaving the earthly relationships, he is no longer her little boy. Their primary relationship will no longer be mom and son. Now their primary relationship, when Jesus is raised from the dead and glorified in heaven, now their relationship will be He is the divine redeemer, and she is a human being that has received redemption. Way back in Genesis, when God created them, he created them male and female, man and woman. And after the fall of Adam and Eve, God said that he would cause the seed of the woman to crush the head of the seed of Satan. And so he's speaking as God to a human being now. He says, woman, 
This is our new relationship. It's, it's the voice of loving authority to end the old relationship and to create a new relationship. It, again, takes me back to Genesis 1, where God invented marriage. And he spoke right then about ending old families and starting new families. He said, man and woman will come together and become one new family. And he said, in future generations, you will leave your father and mother's family and be joined to your wife and become a new family. So he was, he was ending and starting families. And this is what Jesus is doing now. Jesus is now her savior. John the disciple is now her oldest son. Jesus has adopted them to each other. Remember, friends, as we look at this passage, what we're talking about is that Jesus is making new families. Well, we come now to the third and final point that I'd like to share with you, and that's this. Why in this passage, and every time actually in the Gospel of John, is John the disciple referred to not by his name John, but rather by this term, the disciple whom he loved, whom Jesus loved. Did you know that? Did you know in the Gospel of John, John is never called John? Now we're not talking about John the Baptist, we're talking about his youngest disciple named John. This term is used about five times in the gospel. Why would it say the disciple whom he loved? Notice it doesn't say the disciple that Jesus loved more than all the others. He did not say that. He just called him the disciple whom he loved. Didn't Jesus love the other disciples? Of course he did. He loved them. He he walked with them. He served them. He ministered to them. He died for them. And he gave them important responsibility in the kingdom, just like you and me. He loves us also. But it seems he had a special kind of relationship with John. We would just have to use our imagination and think about how this could have developed. John, evidence seems to indicate, was the very youngest of the disciples. He was probably a young teenager, while the rest of them were young men. And the Bible also makes clear that John was one of three in Jesus' inner circle. You know, Jesus had on an outer circle layer of hundreds of disciples. Then he had an, another group of about 70 or 72 disciples that he sent out on missions. And then he had, the, of course, the well-known 12 disciples. But within that 12, there was an inner, inner circle of three that saw only certain miracles that the rest did not see. And John was one of the members of that inner circle. The Bible also indicates that they had a special relationship when at that last supper, the last meal that Jesus would have with his disciples, and it was a Passover meal. The disciples are reclined around the table in ancient Eastern style. And John was right next to Jesus. He had one of the most special places at the table. He was right next to Jesus. And the Bible says John leaned his head on Jesus. You know, you could kind of uh, imagine it. Uh, I've seen photographs, for example, of uh, military units from World War II and and some sports um, pictures and so forth where the guys are just hanging out. And sometimes you'll notice a guy, one guy has his hand on the other guy. Somebody else is leaning against another guy, and so forth. So it's, it's kind of a male bonding thing. I think maybe we get a clue about how Jesus felt about John when we take a look in our Bible about how Paul felt about Timothy. You remember Paul said, I have no other helper like him. He's the one that really understands my heart, my mind, and my mission. He's the one, like myself, who is out to accomplish the purpose of God more than his own purposes. He is like a son to me. Timothy, my son, he said. I believe this is perhaps part of how Jesus felt toward the young John. And John was the the author of the Gospel of John. So would you think maybe that was John being kind of arrogant or did he have a sense of superiority 
Or was he proud of his achievements that he kept writing that into the Gospel of John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the disciple who Jesus loved? I don't think that's it at all. If, if, he, if, he, was a, if he was proud and arrogant, he certainly would not have been one of the favorites of Jesus. No, I think John kept writing that in because he was kind of known to be that by the disciples. And it was his way of expressing his deep gratitude for the love of Jesus to him. It was his identity. I'm the one that Jesus loved. Not I'm the one that accomplished this or I'm the one that did that. Here is my greatest claim to fame, that Jesus loves me. The Apostle Paul again gives us more insight into this. Paul himself said, you know, I'm the worst of all sinners, and yet Christ loved me and gave himself for me. The Apostle Paul said, I, I've given up every trophy and every claim to pride that I have. I've just given it up. I've burned it up. It's like trash to me because there's only one thing that makes me who I am. There's one thing that gives me value. There's one thing that gives me hope. There's one thing that means more to me than anything else. He loves me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch and a wreck like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind. But now I see. Friends, as we consider these few words that Jesus gasped out to Mary and John, what we're seeing is Jesus is making new families. He's making us a new family on earth, and that is our church family among believers. And he's making us part of a heavenly, eternal family. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, he says, Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with God's people, and you are members of God's household. Family. The scripture says, therefore, in the family of God, treat the older men in the church as if they're fathers. Teach the older women and relate to the older women in church as if they are your mothers. Treat the younger men as your brother and treat the younger women as your sisters in all purity. God is making new families by the death of Jesus on the cross. The barriers come down and we are now one. I'm so glad to be part. Father God, we come to you this today to say thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy, God, as we celebrate and commemorate what your son has did for us on the cross. We pray, Lord, that we will never forget it, that we always celebrate and we always share the good news, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. I have been given the assignment of the fourth word, the fourth utterance of Jesus from the cross, found in Matthew, the 27th chapter, verses 45 and 46. This is what it reads. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama salabathion. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just for a few minutes, I want to come from this thought of lessons 
from the cross. We have all come to what is considered the climax of Jesus' ministry. Yes, I say Jesus' ministry because Jesus was still ministering to us while on the cross. The seventh word from the cross are are more than just sayings of Jesus Christ. They are lessons from the cross that points, that positions, and that prepares us for the sole purpose of pleasing God. Lessons from the cross can be heard in each and every word. So the lesson from the cross via the fourth word points you to a relationship that's necessary in order for us to please God. The fourth utterance from the cross begins with Eli, Eli, which is my God, my God. It's important that we recognize the nexus between the fourth word from the cross and the Messianic Psalm 22, where Jesus repeats this verse. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Jesus addresses his father as God. This is the only time within a prayer Jesus ever addressed his father as God. Before throughout the prayers, we know him called Father as Abba. Throughout the scriptures, we see the reference where Jesus called God the Father. John 10, 30 tells us, I am and my Father are one. John 16, 28 tells us, I come forth from the Father and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. Matthew 26, 39 tells us, and he went a little beyond them and fell on his face, praying, saying, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but your will be done. Luke 2, 49 tells us, but why, but why did you need to search? He asks, didn't you know that I was about my father's house? John 4, 2 tells us, my father's house has many rooms that if it were not so, would I have not told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? I believe that in our darkest hour, our true identity of relationships are exposed. I can't help think about Psalm 2710, where he says, when my father, my father, and my mother forsake me, then the Lord has taken me. Lessons from the cross not only point us to God, but it also positions us to be reconciled by God. And between the sixth and the ninth hour, Jesus became the sin offering for the world. This is where we start to see a positioning in our renewing our relationship, in our reestablishing our relationship with God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us this, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteous of God in him. Jesus experienced separation from the Father that he never experienced before, with the purpose of positioning you and I to be reconciled back to God. Romans 3, 25 and 6 tells us this. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin or in the King James, the propitiation. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in time past. Positioning is so important. But the one thing about positioning, oftentimes when we position ourselves, it, it, it hurts. What do I mean by that? It, it not only hurts, maybe it's a little uncomfortable. Have you ever took a portrait and you went to Sears or you went to some other department store or, or, store or some of your friends came in and took a, a, a photo of you and they sat you down. And when they sat you down, they tried to position you in a certain way. And when they positioned you, sometimes you had to turn to the side and you had to turn your head back towards them and this position feels awkward. It feels uncomfortable. But the outcome after of this positioning is beautiful because you end up loving the pictures that you take. Lessons from the cross not only point us to God, but it also position us to be reconciled by God. Guess what? We are reconciled to God even when we don't feel like we are our best, even when we don't feel comfortable, even when it hurts. Guess what? We are still reconciled to him because we are positioning him. And all this is because what Jesus Christ did 
on the cross. Third thing, lessons from the cross. It prepares you and I for his purpose. Let's look at the 47th through the 49th verse, and it tells us this. It says, some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on the reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come to him. Some of those who were listening seemed and they had a mistaken that Jesus was calling out to Elijah when he said, Eli, Eli, my God, my God. We witnessed this fulfillment in God's word found in that same Psalm 22, verse 15, where it says, My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. As God prepares us for his purpose, you will encounter people who just do not understand you. You will encounter people who may not even like you. They will try to project their thoughts, their desires. They will try to make you make sense out of things that they do not understand. They will try to make sense of what you are going through, but they do not understand why. Because God is preparing you for something beyond they understand. But as a child of God walking in purpose, you understand that you you understand that he who began the good work in you is faithful to complete it. No matter what the situation looks like, no matter what your circumstances are, God will never leave you nor forsake you. No matter how dark it may seem, no matter how bad the situation may be, no matter if you feel abandoned, God is preparing you for his purpose. I love what John 14 tells us. It tells us this. Don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough rooms in my father home. If there were not so, I would have told you that. I am going to prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am and you know the way and to where I am going. Whenever you feel separated from God, consider your context, consider your condition, and consider the cure. Jesus on a cross said, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? He felt abandoned, but there was always a purpose behind it, and that purpose was to point us to God. That purpose was to position us in a right relationship. And that purpose was for us or to prepare us to live out his purpose for our lives. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Guess what? He hasn't because he said he will never leave you nor forsake you. Father God, we come to you to say thank you for this opportunity. For all that you have done, God, this opportunity to to worship you as we celebrate this Good Friday. Father God, I ask that you would touch each and every individual that are that are online and, and hearing these seven last words, God, that it will prick their hearts, that they will remember all that you have done. But more importantly, God, that they will share the good news, the gospel, because we know that three days later he rose from the dead. We thank you and we praise you. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Above all powers, above all kings, Above all nature and all created things Above all wisdom and all the ways of man You were here 
before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth. Measure what you were crucified and laid behind a stone. You live to die, rejected and alone, like the rose trampled on the ground. You took. Good afternoon, everyone. What a pleasure it is to be here in the house of the Lord at Christ Baptist Church. We are blessed to be continuing our journey here with the seven last words of Jesus Christ. And I have been granted the benefit of giving, bringing the word, the fifth word, taken from John 19, 28. I thirst. Here we see Jesus is on the cross, and it would be natural for us to understand that Jesus was thirsty. In a way, we see Jesus' humanity played out here as he's on the cross. It, was, it doesn't fool us or it doesn't surprise us that at this point in Jesus' life that we see that he thirsts. But is that really what Jesus is leading us to do? 
Does Jesus only want us to know at this point in his life, as he is at death's door, knocking, death is knocking at his door, that he wants us to know that he thirsts? Well, let me, in the next few minutes, challenge us to say that perhaps there's even more here than just the human thirst. And to understand that, I want to remind us first, we need to look at the whole verse that we see, for it begins, chapter 28, later, as we continue the journey with Jesus Christ, knowing that everything had been now finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst, or I am thirsty. What is Jesus really thirsty for? To be, begin to understand that, I think we need to remember to look at the whole book of John because John just isn't the story of Jesus' life, but it puts it in the context of from the beginning to the end. To understand that, if we went back to John chapter 1, John starts his gospel very differently. For we see John put, brings us to the place where he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the word was God. And we, as we travel down the verse, we see that gee, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only son whom came from the father full of grace and truth. And Jesus is the word. So we see John starts not at the birth of Christ, but he starts and places Jesus at before creation, that Jesus was part of creation. And John is going to bring us to the end to realize that it's just not at the cross in Jesus' death, but it's at eternity. So as we see that big umbrella, we see that Jesus is reminding us he thirsts for something deeper. He thirsts for us to understand why he came. Jesus reminds us that first, that he thirsts as he reveals it, knowing that everything has now been finished. So we see Jesus is now at the, near the end of his earthly life. And he can see from his place, his work is finished. What is that work? We need to be reminded that Jesus came for a purpose. And that purpose is for the redemption of souls. That he came to redeem that which is lost. He came to redeem that which was broken so it could be fixed. And Jesus came that we could be restored, that we would have the restoration of our souls. So that scripture may be fulfilled as well. And let me say, there is a lot of things we could go to, but I want to bring our attention to one particular place today. So that the scripture may be fulfilled, let us go to John 14. Again, keeping it under the umbrella of what Jesus was teaching us. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father... And the Father will give you another comforter or advocate to help you and be with you forever. Here we see that Jesus is promising the coming of the Holy Spirit. So he thirsts for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And that scripture may be fulfilled that God's kingdom would be built here on earth. So as we understand what is Jesus really meaning by this thirst... I think if we go back to John 4, we'll see Jesus with the encounter uh, with the Samaritan woman at the well. There also we see that Jesus says, I thirst. And as he approaches the well, of course, the disciples went off to town to get food. He sent them on a message, a, me a, a, miss a mission to get food. He came across this woman at the well at 12. It was noon. Very few people were at the well at noon. And Jesus approaches her and says, could you get me something to drink? In other words, he's saying, I thirst. But as we see this encounter, we realize that Jesus isn't just asking the woman for water. In fact, the woman doesn't want to give him water. In fact, the woman doesn't even want to give him the time of day. Basically, she said, why are you asking me for water? I'm a Samaritan, and you're not supposed to talk to me. And so we see... As they begin this encounter, Jesus says, well, if you knew who you were talking to, you would be asking me to understand the great gift of God that is in your presence. That the one who comes to me, that if I give them to drink, they will thirst no more. Jesus said in verse 13, everyone who drinks this water 
will be thirsty again as the well, but I know whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman then says, Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. You see, Jesus understood his thirst. His thirst wasn't just for water. His thirst for was this woman who was lost. His thirst was that this woman would receive eternal life. His thirst was that this woman would accept him as Messiah. And then he, as she accepts him, she goes into the community. And from her testimony, we see that her, his thirst even for the village of the Samaritans there, that they would come and believe in Christ. So through this encounter, we see Jesus points the finger. He uses his thirst as a conversation point. He uses his thirst to point to the woman where her deep thirst is. It's not just at the well for water. It's at the soothing of her soul. So we see Jesus on the cross. So Jesus once again says, I am thirsty. I thirst. Again, perhaps this is a conversation point for each one of us. As we hear Jesus come to us today, he says, I thirst. What do you hear? As he speaks to you, could you get me some water? What do you hear? What do you thirst for today? Do you thirst for, thirst for the natural water, the natural things of life to soothe our souls? Or do you search for the supernatural? Today, as we come in this time, which is an amazing time for us, it's a dire time, but it's a time of hope for the people of God. We're reminded that on the cross, Jesus says, I thirst. And even on the cross, I suspect that Jesus is saying, I thirst for the restoration of my soul to be reunited with God. He wants to draw close to God again because our sin was cast on him. Our sin has separated him from God. He thirsts for that relationship again. Today, do you thirst for that relationship? Let me encourage you. Now that everything has been taken away from us, just like you, everything was taken away from him. He's on the cross, bare, near death. And he thirsts to be restored with God. Do you thirst to be restored with God? Let me encourage you, church. Today is a time that God is calling us to come. And thirst for the supernatural. Thirst for the things of God. Thirst for that relationship with God so that we can be like Jesus. And we have a conversation point. We can go to someone and say, could I, you give me something to drink? I thirst. What do you thirst for? I thirst that you might come to know, know the Messiah. Just as Jesus came to the Samaritan woman. A woman who he shouldn't have been talking to, the culture says. He came to her to soothe her inner thirst. To soothe her soul, to soothe the fact that she was lost, and he came to save her. Secondly, I believe that, that Jesus is reminding us that in this thirst, in this conversation point, that he has come, and he is going, that the Holy Spirit might come. So we want to, Jesus is asking us, what do you thirst for? As we enter into that right relationship with God, we see God is calling us. To be with him. And we know his heart. We, we understand his plan. Not only for our lives, but for the world and for the church. And then when we're in that right relationship, then we're reminded that the power of the Holy Spirit is released from us. And I really do believe that if we are willing, that we're going to see the potential of revival spread through our nation. Spread through the world. Because as the church comes now... Take it with everything taken away, drawing close to God, then the Holy Spirit will come if you'll allow the Holy Spirit to have control of your life. Not only do we believe in Jesus for eternity, but God wants us to and be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Today I want to ask you, will you allow the power of the Holy Spirit to be released in your life? Will you allow the power of the Holy Spirit not only to fill you, but to control you? We will allow God to be Lord and master over your life. And then as we do that, as we're walking in a right relationship with God, as the power of the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, then we're reminded that God came to save lost. Jesus came 
to set the Samaritan woman free. He set her free, and in her freedom, she went to the village, and as she gave her testimony, she set the village free. And they came out to the well, and they talked with Jesus and said, stay with us so we can hear from you. And they believed today as we are released by the power of the Holy Spirit, will you allow God to help you share your story? And as you share your story, then God will release others and those around us who will say, I thirst. You will enter into a conversation with them and then you will be able to release them. Brothers and sisters, today, let us humble ourselves. Let us pray. Let us recognize that the season of quietness isn't just to be filled up with playing games or going on the computer, but it's a time where we draw close to God. As we draw close to God, we see as Jesus was separated from God, his Father, on the cross, he thirsted for that relationship. It is Soon he'll say, it is finished. That relationship will be restored. In that restoration, the Spirit will come. And the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will move in power. And he'll move through the church. He'll move through our nation. He'll move through our world that many will be saved. Today, as God prepares us, let us come humbly. Let us bow before the Lord our God. And let us receive the Messiah, the Lord, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And let us walk with him in power and might and obey him. In the name of Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, because our Father in heaven loves us and directs us to go into all the nations. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this time together. We thank you for this journey to the cross and to the, the death of Christ, only to know the answer. But today we come like the Samaritan woman. We come like Jesus. We say, Lord, I thirst. Not for the natural, but for the supernatural. I thirst for a right relationship with God. Father, show me what you want me to give back to you. Father, as I have unburdened myself of all the things of the world, Holy Spirit, as you empower me and prepare me, allow me not to put everything back in the trunk that I've emptied out. Direct our paths. That we will be wholly committed to you and given to you. And Holy Spirit, send us out. We've got a story to tell to the nations. We have a story to tell like the Samaritan woman. We have water that comes from heaven above that once someone drinks from it, they will never thirst again. Quench the inner, inner thirst that only you can take away. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. I, my assignment, my assignment is the sixth word, which is from John 19 and 30. And let us read that scripture. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Uh, I want to preach from the word no regrets, no regrets, no regrets. First of all, before I begin, I would like to say a brief prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to preach your word, an opportunity to share, Father God, with those who are the viewing audience, Lord. Now, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be an acceptable gift in your sight. O oh, Lord, you are our strength and you are our Redeemer. It is finished. Finished means that you have completed whatever your assignment was. Uh, finished means that, that there's nothing else to be done. And when Jesus said, it is finished, in the sixth word, he basically was saying to us that his mission, his purpose, his objectives and goals had been completed. I want to take this scripture from a little bit of a different perspective. How do you know when something is finished? How do you know? Once you know that it is finished, it's done, then you have no regrets. 
one of the things that, that I've learned in life is that in order for you to finish any task, you have to see the end from the beginning. Now, what does that mean? That means you have to be able to look to the end, how the end is going to look. In order for you to know what you have to do in the beginning, you have to know what it's going to look like when it's finished. Uh, it's almost like building a house. First of all, an architect will give you the design of the house. He tells you exactly how the house is supposed to, to look. Then they begin construction. And when you finally have the, found, the finished product, you will go in, look at it, and make sure that it meets all of the specifications. Life is the same. Whenever you start a task, you need to look at the beginning, and then you also need to look at the end. If you don't know how it's going to end, then guess what? You won't know whether or not you have completed the job or you have met it according to your specifications. Life is the same way. One of the things that I, that I, I learned when I was in college, how many freshmen came, freshmen came to, to college and had no major. They said they didn't know whether or not they were going to major in political science and geography, whether they wanted to be doctors or lawyers. You know, I knew when I went to college that I had one opportunity, just one chance. And I knew that I, my parents did not have the finances to, to allow me to be in college and to have a good time and not focus on the academic parts of it. And so what I did is I was very clear. I chose the college that I was going to based on what my interests were, based on what I thought my talents and abilities. So when I went to college, I was very serious about finishing. And I knew if I finished college that I could get a better job, I could get a, a better position and have a better life than what my parents had. So what I did is I was looking at the end from the beginning. You always have to look at the end from the beginning. And this is what Jesus did. Jesus, when he was born, he realized and recognized what his purpose was, what his mission was, what his objectives are, what his challenges are, what the opposition would do to try to prevent him from completing his task. And finally today, he can say on the cross, having gone through all of that, it is finished. I've done it. I've finished whatever that I have set out to do. I've finished what God has sent me to earth to do that is to save humanity. One of the problems that we have with the COVID-19 virus is, I don't believe that, that this country, and maybe even the world, saw the end from the beginning. We have been spending our whole, uh, the, I guess the last six or eight weeks, chasing the virus, rather than having the right preparation, rather than knowing what the end is gonna look like. That's why every day I see Dr. Fauci on TV, and he talk about trying to flatten the curve. If we're going to flatten the curve, we ought to know what the flatten of the curve looks like. What are the resources we need? How are we going to approach the problem? The same thing is in life. Anything that you would do in life, you ought to have a clear vision before you start it what the end is going to be. Because if you don't know what the end is going to be, you won't know when you have finished. And so that's why it's important. Isaiah 46 and 10 really says it so beautifully. God says in Isaiah, or Isaiah writes, he says, from the beginning, I have revealed the end. From the day that God created us, he has revealed the end. That's why Revelation is in the Bible. The, the Bible is not a book that was written, and we keep wait, waiting for the next chapter or the next verse or the next pericope to come along. God has already started. Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning to the end. He told us, we know what the end is going to look like. We know how the beginning has started. I mean, has started. So God has revealed the end, okay, from the beginning. He goes on to say, From long ago, I told you things that had not yet happened. There's a lot of things in life that haven't happened yet. But God has told us what those things are going to happen. So we, can, we know there's going to be pestilence. We know we're going to go through these problems. Have we prepared ourselves? And a lot of times, you know, we take signs and wonders as if they're just information that's being given to us. We're going through climate change right now. The earth is speaking to us and telling us the earth is changing and we continue to ignore it. We continue to do the same things that we, we've done before. We continue to invest our monies and dollars in carbon fuel. We continue to fail to put energies into electronic cars. We fail to realize that the summers are getting hotter, the winters are getting warmer. We realize that the ocean is rising. We have to see the end 
from the beginning. So God has seen the end from the beginning, and he's telling us we need to be diligent. We need to pay attention to the detail. The second thing I think that Jesus did, and what he has done is when he says it is finished, he counted the cost. How much does it cost? What is the resources? What sufficiency? Sufficiency means what are the resources you need? How much risk do I need to take? Sometimes we can't be risk adverse. A lot of times in our lives, we don't do things because we're afraid. But God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of knowledge, sound mind. God has given us things that said, look, use those gifts, use those talents. Help to make a difference in your community. Help to make a difference in the things that we are doing. That's why I'm so impressed with all of the people, not just the doctors and the, the medical professions, professionals who are out there helping to keep the supply chain moving. Even though we are being quarantined in our houses, guess what? The grocery shelves are still being, being uh, packed. The grocery stores are still open. The drug stores are open. The necessary things that we need to sustain life while we are being isolated from this virus. There are people out there working every day to make it happen. And we need to give them credit and honor. They are risking, risking their lives for us. You know, we're sitting back very comfortable, but somebody else is taking the risk. So sometimes you have to count the cost. They have counted the cost. They realize that every day they get up in the morning to go to work, they realize that they're putting their family Families, they're putting themselves in jeopardy, but they do it anyway. They do it because they have a better, uh, they have a better view of life. They're seeing the end from the beginning. They realize if we do these small things, guess what? We will overcome this pandemic. We'll overcome this pestilence that we are dealing with. First of all, if you don't count the cost, sometimes you will pay the price. I want to say that again. If you don't count the cost, you will definitely pay the price. If you're risk adverse, you will never get an opportunity to whom much is given, much is expected. You so what I'm saying to you today, Jesus knew the cost. He saw the beginning from the, he saw the end from the beginning. There's a story that I always love to tell to talk about risk taking. When I played football, I was one of the, the lightest guys on the field. I was a, a wide receiver or an end, very fast. But I always said that, you know, I took advantage and I made observations to, to optimize and to maximize my abilities and talent. We had an a, 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 a exercise that we used when I played football, and that was called two-on-one blocking. So Coach Crank came to me one day, and he challenged me. He said, Winfrey, he said, you're the smallest guy on the, t the, t the field. Why don't you get in this two-on-one block and, and see can you, you uh, move or outmaneuver this tackle, this big guy, you know, named Ed Odoms and Raymond Biggers. He said, get in there and see if you can do it. I don't think he thought I would do it. I said, okay, no problem. But what I had done while they were blocking and, and working with other people, I had watched their moves. I knew the things, the habits that they had. I knew the tendencies that they were, they were using. So in two and one blocking, you have two, two linemen in front of one person, and the objective is to move them out of, out of the hole, as they so speak, as so to speak. So the first time I stood there, I noticed that they always went low. They always went to, to block you from your, your thighs and your, and your knees back to move you out of the hole. So I said to myself, if they go low, I'm going to go high. That's what I did. I said, sometimes in life when people go low, you have to go high. So I waited till they made their move. They went low. I went high. I was able to leap over them and get the flag behind them. They were so mad. They were going like, wow, how could this little guy, you know, you know get over, get, get around us? And, the, and the, you could see the coaches really harassing them. Hey, man, you are 200 pounds. Hey, you are 195 pounds. And you're letting this little 155-pound wide receiver get by you. So they came the second round very angry. But I knew one thing about them. They had lost their focus. They had, they had really started to, to think to themselves that we need to get even. So the next time, I knew that they were going to anticipate me going high. So they went, when they, so when they decided to lift up off their three-point stand, I knew they were off balance. So I hit them in the gut, in the middle, 
pushed him off balance, moved in, and was able to pull the flag, flag off. So sometimes you got to anticipate your enemy's move. And then finally, for those who are football fans may, may realize what I'm talking about, so the foul time, they said, look, we're going to get him this time. I'm going to go low, you go high, because he has no way to, nowhere, no place to go. Guess what I did? I decided that I was going to turn one into the other. So what I did, I grabbed the one guy's jersey, pushed him into the other, they blocked each other, and I was able to walk around. Now, why I'm telling you this story? Sometimes in life, you have to be able to know when to go lie low. Sometimes you know how to when, know when to stand still. I like what Paul says about this. Paul says, whatever state I am in, I've learned to be content. You have to be able to count the cost. I would have never gotten into that exercise if I felt that I was going, going to get hurt. But I understood that I was using the resources. I understood exactly what was before me. The third thing that Jesus did, very long story, the, la the third thing he, he did was he stayed focused. The problem that we have in life is because we don't finish things, we take on more tasks than we are able to complete. We take on more jobs. We have more balls in the air. We have more responsibility. You know, there's only 24 hours in the day. And sometimes I think we believe that we're a super person, superman. We believe that we can, you know, leap tall buildings. You know, we can move things just by our minds and by our, our wit. Sometimes we think that we're, we're smarter than we really are. You have to stay focused. You know, Jesus was very focused. You know, he, after his bar mitzvah, I call it the bar mitzvah, when he was about 12 years old, he, the Bible doesn't tell us much about him. The Bible is really silent. And that's okay. A lot of people talk, talk about what he did and what he didn't do. I think he accepted the responsibility that he had because after his father, uh, Joseph, died, his earthly father, he probably, as the oldest son, took on the responsibility to look after his mother, to look after his sisters and brothers. But then when they came of age, I'm sure he turned that responsibility over to, to them. He focused on being a carpenter. But when it came time to be the Messiah, he stepped up to the, the task. He stepped up to the job. That's why at Cana, the wedding at Cana of Galilee, he said to his mother, my time has not yet come. He said, hey, look, there's a plan. I'm staying focused. I, you know, I want to do it according to the purpose and plan that God has given me. You need to do the same thing in your life. Do it according to the purpose and plan that his God has given us. We're in a pandemic. We're, we're dealing with a very deadly, deadly pestilence. And you have to stay focused. You can't go back to, to the old ways. You have to do what is necessary for us to overcome this invisible enemy. You know the good thing about, about staying focused? Sometimes in life, we have to do fewer things than trying to do more things. Matthew 25 speaks to this so eloquently. It says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. Notice the word, few things, not many things, few things. And he says, and I will make you ruler over many things. Sometimes we have to take the small things, the very small things, and then God sees our faithfulness and he elevates us to higher things. A lot of times we want to sit at the top, but sometimes when you're at the top, that's not good because you may not be ready. You may not have the experience. You may not have the, re you may not have the, the, uh, the knowledge or the understanding. Sometimes you have to work your way from the bottom to the top. And God speaks in Matthew 25 to that. He said, when you're faithful over a few things, a few things that you have in the church, a few things that you have in life, do it with excellence. Do it with grace. Do it with pride. Do it with, with self-confidence. God sees what you're doing. You may not be the leader of that group. You may not be the president of that organization. But if you're the secretary, are you the one who's responsible for organizing uh, the, the, the calendar? Do it with excellence. And guess what? Someone will see you. And then you can be elevated to another level. You know, a lot of people want to be pastors, but they don't realize exactly how do you get there. There's education, there's time, there's experience. Some people want to be CEOs, but how do you get to be a CEO? How do you be a leader? Being a faithful leader to a ruler. 
You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. And God says in Matthew 23, he says, enter into my joy. Wow. The joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. The praise of the Lord. Macbeth, I mean, one of the things that, that I've always said to myself, I, whatever I do in life, I want to do it to please God. I'm not trying to please men. I'm trying to please God. But I have to serve men and women. I have to serve humanity, you know. And so, therefore, you know, do it by focusing, staying focused. Number four, live your life with no regrets. Jesus did not have any regrets when he came to the cross. He understood that he had fulfilled his mission, his destiny. Isn't that wonderful? He, can, he didn't look back over his life on the cross and said, I should have, I would have, I could have. He said, Father, it is finished. I fulfilled my destiny. I fulfilled my purpose. I fulfilled the cause for which I came into the earth. I am ready to give up my life because now I have lived it without any regrets. One of the sad things that I see in life is when people get older and they talk about the things they could have done. I've heard him say, I, I really wish I had opened up that business. I really wish I had gone to finish my education. I really wish I had married my, my childhood sweetheart. The woulda, the coulda. But you know why? Because if you're not focused, if you don't see the end from the beginning, if you don't, and you haven't counted the cost, you will make those mistakes. Today, we want to make sure, and I want to make sure that you understand, live your life with no regrets. You know what is the biggest enemy of time? Procrastination. Always saying, I'll get to it tomorrow. Time waits for no one. Moses' Psalm, Psalms 90, speaks to us, speaks to that. It talks about how the flower is, is, and the grass is green in the morning, but then over time and, and the heat of the day, it withers away. And life will wither away from you if you don't grab it with excitement and enjoy and go with enthusiasm. You know, don't be one who's a pure dweller. Don't be one who's always talking about, I, I don't have the time to do, I don't have the confidence. You do, God gave you those gifts. Use those gifts to make a difference. And that's what God is saying to us today. Jesus is saying to us on the cross, he's saying, it is finished. Finish what God has called you to do. You know, I like uh, Shakespeare, and in that trilogy of Macbeth, when I was in high school, you know, I remember these words. They were so powerful. It is really almost a summation of Psalms 90. It says, gather ye rosebuds while ye may. O time still is a flying. The same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. Do you get that? You know, take advantage of your youth. I've always tell my daughter, I say, you can fail. Because guess what? Failure is a teacher. Failure gives you the opportunity to correct it. But you know, the worst thing in the world is not being a fool. The worst thing in the world, I heard Sam Proctor say, Proctor say this, is nothing like an old fool. Someone who's done things over and over again and never has really completed any task that has been assigned to them. And lastly, the fifth thing, which takes me back to the original, my original premise, that word that I was assigned, it is finished. It is finished because you have given all that you could, because you have done as much as you could to make it possible. You don't have to worry about it because it's finished. God had finished it. It is because for everyone to whom much is given, much would be required. To whom much has been committed, then much will be asked. Do you hear what I'm saying? To whom much is given, much is required. To whom much is committed, to him also much more would be asked. So when you have more, God wants you to give more. It's very open in Jesus' name. And as we come to the, to the end of this message, these are the words that I would like to, to leave with you. Jesus paid the full price. There's nothing else to be added. There's nothing else to be taken from, from it. Jesus' payment leaves nothing to our imagination because he said, it is finished. Done. Done. Finished means done. 
completed. And you know what? This is why today, when we look at God, we can look at these six words, and you can say the same words that I said. We have no regrets, because God has given us the ability to see the end from the beginning. He's told, taught us how to count the cost. He's telling us to stay focused, to live a life without regret. When you can do those things, then guess what? No matter what you do in life, you can say, it's finished. God bless you.
come now to our seventh word, the seventh cry, the seventh statement of Jesus from the cross. Let us pray. Eternal God, we do thank you, Lord, for this great day of remembrance of your son giving his life for us. And now we ask you, oh God, if you would just open our hearts, open our minds to fully appreciate that if we come to the end of his suffering on the cross, Lord, that is in this we rejoice to know he's a living Savior. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture text, Luke chapter 23, starting from verse 44 through 46. We invite you to turn with there with us. Luke 23, verse 44 through 46. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. We'd like to talk for just a few moments from the thought, the cry in the darkness, the cry in the darkness. Luke is the only gospel writer who wrote about the interchange between Jesus and the thief on the cross. Uh, this really was a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 53. That where Jesus was crucified, Isaiah 53 says, and he was amongst the transgressors. He was placed in a position where he was amongst those who were sinners, who were criminals. And the mockery we see had a prophetic slant. The mockery that went on as they made fun of him. If you be God, then come down and save yourself. The mockery, the, it was a fulfillment really of Psalm 22 verses 6 through 8. The, the offering of the drink was a fulfillment of Psalm 69. The, the, the light and the darkness motif was, is that which is mentioned in Psalm 22, verses 1 and 2. And Jesus' cry in verse 46 fulfills Psalms 31 and 5. Jesus was living out, the Messiah was living out messianic prophecy right on the cross. Certain questions arise as I read the text over and over. And again, the question I pose is, how did the thief know Jesus had a kingdom? He says, when you get into your kingdom, remember me. Well, probably because of the mockery, the, the, the sign that they placed above the head of Jesus, I-N-R-I. Maybe he realized that in the mockery, he says, but you have a kingdom. Uh, how did he know that Jesus could save him? When you come into your kingdom, remember me. Maybe it's because he heard other folks saying, uh, you saved others, not save yourself. But here's what we find out about this moment in the life of Christ, that even the wrath of man can bring praise to God. Because as they are making fun of Jesus and deriding him, God is going to move with his great love for us. In fact, our Lord in his compassion, notice right here on the cross, he brought a thief out of sin into salvation even while he was dying. Now, I want to suggest to you that this should never be used as an excuse to wait to the last minute to come to Christ. We ought to take every opportunity we can, while you can, while you're in your right mind, make a decision about Jesus. But then I suggest to you that we don't know it's possible this, this was his first invitation to Christ. We don't know if he had, this is the first time he'd come face to face with Jesus. And coming face to face with him, he makes the right decision. And the Bible tells us that our suffering Savior cries in agony, Ale, Ale, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Emerging on the other side of that anguish, the Bible tells us that he suffered that which humans suffer. He was thirsty, I thirst. But beloved, right now as we come into this text, the worst is over. The terrible aspect of sin bearing has been born. And now, all of the God-forsaken things of the past will be through. Jesus comes to this moment, and John alone records it, where he tells us that he's getting ready to begin the victory and rest from the work that he came to do. So it's just three thoughts I want to leave with you, and, and, and it rides within this last words of Christ on the cross. It is finished. First of all, his cry was not the cry of a dying man. 
a weak man. It's not the cry of somebody who is suffering and can't get it out. In fact, the Bible says he cried with a loud voice. He was not some emaciated victim of, of the humanity. Jesus, with a loud voice, cried. By his own will, the Bible says, he breathed his last breath. As he told us in John chapter 10, I, I, listen, nobody take my life. My life, I lay it down freely. He was in full control of the situation. And being in control, one, in fact, one, one her early Christian hymn says that death did not approach Jesus, Jesus approached death. Jesus walked right up to death on the cross and let death know that he did not have power over him. Jesus was the one who would die. The my God, the fourth utterance, the my God, he says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. I commit my spirit. Uh, the word translated commend means to deposit. It means to give to someone that you can trust. There's nobody's hands greater than the hands of God. If you've got to give anybody your soul, give it into the hands of God. Paul used the same term. And so the term is quoted from, from Psalm 31, verse 5. In fact, this whole prayer of Jesus while on the cross was a Jewish child's bedtime prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Jesus says, God, it is finished. I'm giving you my heart. And, and, and really, when you look at the construct in the, in the original language, it, it's, in the, it's in the present tense. He says, Father, I am commending to you my spirit. It is something that may even have a future implication, but you know, with Jesus and God, everything past, present, and future is now. He says, I, commend, I am commending my spirit to you. So his last cry was not the cry of a emaciated dying man. It was a loud voice. Second thought I want to leave with you is that the darkness started somewhere about midday. The darkness, the Bible says, from the sixth to the ninth hour. Uh, there was a solar power failure, and the sun stopped shining for three hours while Jesus was there on the cross. Now, God's been working with the sun for some time now. Remember back in Joshua chapter 10, when the sun stood still over Gibeon? God can stop. And, and really, when you understand the motion of planets in the sun, the sun didn't stand still. The, us, the earth stopped rotating. But God did something with the sun. Isaiah 38, 8 says, the sun went back 10 degrees in the days of Hezekiah. Joel chapter 2 verse 3 prophesied that the sun would turn into, into, into a, a, a darkening and the moon into a river of blood. God does things with the sun. But this is the first time of all the things that the sun ever did, never had the sun taken a three-hour break. One writer says that possibly it was because the S-U-N looked up and saw the S-O-N, its creator, and it blushed. The sun stopped shining as Jesus was hanging there in those last moments. Jesus has stated, and back in Luke chapter 22, that there would become a time when darkness would rule. But even in the midst of the darkness, Jesus is still shining. My third point, and I'm done. From while we're seeing that his voice was not a weak voice, and while we're seeing that the darkness lasted for three hours, simultaneous with the cessation of solar radiance, the Bible says the veil was torn. Now, this is really important because the curtain represented that separation of the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. And so when Jesus died, uh, this temple, the, the, the curtain ripped from top to bottom. When Solomon did his temple, built his temple, the curtain was 30 cubits high. Uh, when, when, when Herod came along, his was 40 cubits high. 60 feet, a, temp, a, a, a curtain separating the holy place from the holy of holies. And, and Josephus and all the writers says, four inches thick. When Jesus died on the cross, a 60 foot high curtain, four inches thick, would rip from top to bottom. And as Christ was there, this shows that God had, he had made a purpose to keep that which was unclean out of the divine holy presence. But now he has placed sin on his son, not in his son, on his son. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 20 says, the curtain represented the flesh of Christ. Little did the enemy ever know that when you put Jesus on a cross, that you didn't tear his flesh. He's going to rip the separation that divides man away from God. Jesus had prophesied in Luke 13, 35, as long as the temple stood, it signified the continuation of the old covenant. But in Hebrews 9, Hebrews 9, rather than focus on what was passing away, 
you kind of go back to Hebrews 8, where they, God is instituting, instituting something new. God has a new thing that he does. Even right now, we're living with God doing a brand new thing. And only one generation after Jesus made his prophetic utterance, 70 AD, the temple was totally destroyed. Beloved, maybe we give too much attention to the building and not to the temple that God wants to build in us. The, 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 the curtain was torn and now man had access unto Jesus. Don't hold on. And, and there's so many things from our past we're holding on to. I'm declaring to you today as I'm ready to take my seat. Don't hold on to something that God says is finished. Jesus says it is finished, God. The assignment you gave me, it is finished. When Jesus says, Father, forgive them, he's calling you. When Jesus said, uh, today, uh, watch out for my mama, John, he's calling you. He's calling mothers to look out for sons and sons to look out for mothers. Today, when Jesus says you can be with me in paradise, he's calling you. He's calling you to come from a world of darkness and to an eternal light. When he says, my God, I feel forsaken, he's calling you to say you can leave a forsaken life. When he was thirsty, he's calling you to the water that never runs dry. He's calling you to a finished time that has been stated by him for eternity. He says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He's calling you. He's calling you to an everlasting life in the hands of God. And because of who Jesus is and what he did on Calvary, that day when he got to this moment, when darkness pervaded the earth, he's calling you. He's calling you. Tell me. What are you going to do? Your time has come for life brand new. And beloved, he is calling you. Bow with me. Eternal God, we thank you for the clarion call that we too can be forgiven, that we too have a place in paradise, that we do too can come under watchful care. We thank you for your clarion call, your clarion announcement that by the hands and by the work of your son Jesus, we too can, even though feeling forsaken sometimes, know that you are very present help in trouble. Thank you for quenching the thirst and finishing the assignment in our lives. Thank you, Jesus, as we've entrusted our souls to you. Bless all of our churches in our area as we've come together to celebrate the service that your son gave on the cross. Be blessed in this worship, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I'm so grateful for your love. You took my place, and now I stand to be called your very own because you. I have no fear of what tomorrow brings because you
He's a faithful God. He has my future in life. Said I knew your name before you were born. Yes, you were. He's a faithful God. He's working everything out for you, God. For He's a God. Thank you all for joining us for our Good Friday service. Special thanks to all the pastors for bringing forth God's word despite the challenges of the coronavirus pandemic. We know God is in control. Continue to pray for one another. Be safe. Be well until we see each other again.